This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. How you doing? What you doing? Oh, getting ready to start this here old podcast there. <laughs> <laughs> getting our podcast all up and going. Don't you know? Oh, you're Rose Nyland. That's cute. I don't know who I am. Uh, yeah, I'm good. How are you doing? Doing well. Yes. We here. We here. Episode 35. Mm-hmm. What's going on? Anything interesting? Uh, Worthwhile? No, it's just been kind of like a busy week. We're trying to gear up to have a, a vacation type experience, and that's going to be fun. We're going to be at the beach. Yeah, that is a vacation type experience, isn't it? <laughs> that's not how normal people speak of vacation, is it? Um, I just go on vacation. Ah, I don't make yes, it a that's type. Right. That's right. Sort will, of event. I will adjust my my. You just lexicon. make it sound like it might be miserable. No, 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 no. I'm really looking <clears throat> forward to it. Me too. Yeah, yeah. Last week of school. Last week. When this episode drops, I'll have one more day. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Are you excited? Yes. You just had graduation for the seniors. I did. We had graduation. They, it was... Um, they stop early, right? What's that? They they stop early. Yeah, seniors always right. get a few days right, different, right. yeah. Planning a graduation in a pandemic is different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We had it outside for the first time ever, and luckily we had great weather, so That's that was good. good. Yep. It seems like it would be kind of chaotic to plan... A regular graduation, let alone a pandemic field one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just, I'm not sure how people, schools who always do it outside, always do it outside. Like, those are just the questions I have. Like, what do uh-huh. you do? Yeah. Especially in Ohio in May. Like, it loves to rain. The weather is very temperamental, yes. So, anyways, what we got this week? Uh, Anything wh- you want to recap? No, I don't. I don't think so. We've been enjoying the nice weather. We've been outside. Mm-hmm. We've been gardening. We had fire, a campfire yeah. last night. That we was did. nice. It was nice. It's a little, it's pretty warm right now in Ohio, actually. It's, it's warmer than, it's hot and it's, sticky. It's been over the 80s for the past five or six days, which yeah. is, I, th- I mean, in Ohio, it will get to be 80 in May, but not normally for this long. It'll mm-hmm. be a day here and there, but it has been nonstop 80 at it's least. Been so it's a good beach practice. Yeah. Yeah. Vacation type experiences. Vacation type experience. Okay. Well, do you want to dive right in? Start, I would love to. Get, get on the, the topic of the week, which is. Yeah. You chose imposter syndrome this week. Yeah, because I feel it. I feel it hard. I feel it as well. Imposter syndrome. uh, You want to start? Sure. Yeah. So. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Imposter syndrome. It's a very buzzword, buzz phrase, I guess, kind of thing. I didn't hear this word until like two years ago. Yeah. It it became popular a couple of years ago as, as a term that people... But I mean, I think people do that when they... People latch on to things when they strongly identify with them, which this imposter syndrome stuff is is a, is a very handy vehicle to well, convey a lot of anxiety. I was definitely questioning some things, and then it was like, oh, this has a name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what is imposter syndrome? All right, so this is from Psychology Today. Uh-huh. People who struggle with imposter syndrome believe that they are undeserving of their achievements and the high esteem in which they are, in fact, generally held. Hmm. And so these people <laughs> feel that they aren't as competent or intelligent as others might think, and that soon enough people will discover the truth about them. What this tells me is that I am generally held in high esteem, and I just don't know it, which makes me feel great, and you are too. Yeah, I think that's actually where I was about to say I had a problem with it. I <laughs> <laughs> My imposter syndrome is coming into... I am generally not held in high esteem, because um, why? Well, because I experience imposter right. syndrome. It's a very <laughs> cyclical... Uh, yeah. And so those with imposter syndrome are often well accomplished. They may hold high office or have numerous academic degrees. Which I don't is where hold both high of office. I'm just no, saying. but we both have multiple degrees. Yes, and that's we do. What have, we're sitting on. We have some pieces of paper from some institutions. Um. So, like I said, two years ago, I it was probably a couple years ago when I first heard this. I was like, oh, thank God. Uh huh. I'm not the only fraud out here. <laughs> we're all frauds. Yeah, we're all frauds. Everyone. <laughs> frauds all the fraud. way down. It's a very so as a, a woman in, in tech. I encounter this a lot, and especially from my female colleagues. But and I include myself in this. I'm not. I, I really don't think I'm generally held in 
in high esteem, by the way. So uh, that was a joke. But anyway, yes, imposter, imposter syndrome used to be called imposter phenomenon. And I actually, when I was doing research for this episode, I found psychology related research that called oh, it yeah. impo- imposter phenomenon. Oh, so okay. you might have heard that. Okay, sure. That was apparently the term first appeared in somewhere around 1978. Oh my God from psychologists so this this has been around for a while but apparently it just became a trendy way to put a bow on a lot of feelings of anxiety related to one's accomplishments and one's career position like how yeah like i was talking about as as a woman in tech it happens a lot because if you're well you're the minority i i you are for sure one is i am yes oh okay but yeah you're working through that i did there's a lot of working uh yes but no i i uh I did feel this, especially because I'm a self-taught <laughs> coder programmer person. Yeah. I, I'm self-taught, and that means that in, when I enter into a lot of scenarios, I always assume that I have no idea what's going on mm-hmm. first. And I usually do have some idea of what's going on, but I always just go into things being you like... You don't have to be dangerous. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yes, that is true. But I just, I kind of always approach a new scenario, or even old, stale scenarios, being like, hmm, I probably don't know what's going on here, but actually, I usually do retrospectively sure and that's kind of what imposter syndrome is it's thinking that you are out of place among your peers with regard to like you know a professional situation or accomplishment or journey or whatever it is and i think it's interesting that you make that point because as a woman in education i'm usually the majority Mm -hmm. like as a female right like in my school i would say women i think i think we definitely have the majority but i wouldn't say it's by a lot Mm-hmm. Um, other schools I've been in, they've been pretty close to 50-50, but still they're usually hinges on. And also like secondary education is a little bit more 50-50. Uh-huh. When you're in early ed, it's a little bit, it's normally more female dominant. So it's interesting to hear you talk about that because even as the majority, right, as a female, I still feel this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> And so maybe it's because I'm comparing myself to the other incredible women that I teach with and I'm like, oh, geez, mm-hmm. I'm not them. Mm-hmm. But, um, or guys too, but I just meant in the terms of what you were saying that your experience is as a female especially Mm -hmm. it's very weighted yeah yeah and i I think it's interesting what you're talking about with the school setting i I think that it comes out in a couple of different ways imposter syndrome in in school settings so it can come out in academic ways but also can produce social struggles so you know you can be be struggling in class or with academic performance because of imposter syndrome but you can also become socially isolated Mm -hmm. at least in the school context if you're a student students with imposter syndrome they they tend to be more likely to make ill-fitting career choices and experience burnout yeah, that's scary. in college and career because your self-doubt is a powerful force so it can make you make bad choices yeah is the deal there but yeah there are studies out there to show that about 70 percent of the general public <laughs> report feeling imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome and that percentage increases in academia So these feelings that you're talking about, they're even more prevalent if you're in like a kind of publisher parish, usually university setting, academic culture, that that can really drive imposter syndrome. But it also does show up in public schools, in both teachers and students. So this is kind of like a general, this is a general phenomenon that doesn't necessarily have strictly to do with education, but I think that education and learning and social development, all of these things play a role in how certain people come to feel like they are imposters among their peers sure so yeah as i was researching this i found that millennials are highly prone to imposter syndrome i don't know why but we're susceptible to career-related anxiety very obviously a a lot of people think that maybe the digital focus of our world now might be Mm -hmm. partially to blame for our outsized yeah association with imposter syndrome right but i think also just the economic climate at the time in which we entered the job market probably had a lot to do yeah. with it. When I remember coming up through college even and everyone being like, oh, the baby boomers are going to retire. You're going to get a job. And meet. Like there was all this push to replace the baby boomers for us. And like we graduated, I, my undergrad was 2012. Mm-hmm. So I remember the whole, all four years of undergrad, they were like, oh, the baby boomers, the baby, you know what I mean? So there was this push for all of us currently to be like get our together basically to go get a job because we all needed to get out there because they were retiring Mm -hmm. so there was the the force and the pressure of that i mean i think now as millennials we can say there's been the the boomers have kind of hung over our head as this incredible generation so i 
I always kind of felt like there was this pressure involved with. Yeah, like, they also didn't retire at the rate that they were supposed to. No, well, because they can't. <laughs> and a wages lot of have stagnated. Have failed them, yeah, but and yes. wages have stagnated since like 1985 in this country. Right. So that creates incredible pressure on the job market, and that translates directly to right. the kind of anxiety that we're yeah. talking about. Yeah, but I mean, I just feel like generally speaking, like I don't know, maybe this was just because I was in education and there was such a push, but. It was always, you know, we've got to replace the baby boomers when they start retiring. There's going to be a teacher shortage. And I would say maybe this year there's a teacher sort- shortage. <laughs> I would anticipate a much larger one next year. Yeah. But um, in my in my scope of public education in central southeastern Ohio, I haven't seen a great shortage. I've seen schools yeah. cutting positions that they need. Yeah. But there's, it's not because they can't hire someone. I would say overall there's a teacher shortage, but it really is kind of geography dependent. Oh, well, sure. Um, if you get into the Carolinas who have horrible retirement system and that kind of thing, then yes, they're always at a shortage because they don't have the benefits yeah. so many other states do. It's also but just yes. there's usually a shortage in more urban education yeah, environments true. too. Hey, maybe we should pay teachers more. Thoughts? Maybe we should stop defunding education. Hey, just a thought. That's so weird. Maybe get us some good insurance and we retirement. Really gotta, we really got to make stickers. And some for, normal things. Stickers for maybe we should stop defunding I don't know. Education. Maybe make it so that you could teach and survive without having to have other jobs. Huh. That's weird. That's a concept. Anyways. Yeah, back to imposter syndrome. Uh, <laughs> I had a note in here that I just want to point out that it's not always weird or bad or raw. Like, you know... Imposter syndrome makes you feel like you're weird about or wrong or out of place, but it's also not always the case that it's a bad thing to feel a little bit unsure of yourself. So like, it's called imposter syndrome, which sounds like a kind of scary name or something wrong with me if I have this, but mm-hmm. a lot of these feelings are kind of normal. You know, like, am I doing this right? That I deserve to end up where I am? I shouldn't be taking this for granted. Should I have this title or career that. or whatever? It's okay. something to appreciate. Yeah. It's okay to wonder about that stuff and to acknowledge that you had a journey <laughs> you've made progress and mm-hmm. that you know it's okay to just ask questions about that journey about your professional life about where you are and where you are in relation to your peers and stuff like that questions about that stuff are normal and good and don't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with you right. that you need to fix the the problem is you got to just watch out for how it can impact your your growth moving forward I agree with that I think that's when imposter syndrome can kind of step in and rear its ugly head so do you want to play a game Oh, I would love to. It's called, what type of imposter syndrome do we have? Oh, okay. Okay. Is it just limited to one or can I have more than one type? You, uh, I think you can pick and choose. Do I, okay, let's, let's make, you can some, make a mix and match. How about we each have to pick one that we think is most Okay, like I already us. know what you are though. Oh, okay. 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 So there's five types oh, boy. Okay. of imposter syndrome. Okay. okay. You first. Ready? Okay. So I'm just going to run through the types and ask you questions. Okay. The first one is called the perfectionist. Uh huh. Would you like me to ask you the questions, or would you like to admit that this is what you have? Oh, you you think I'm the perfectionist? Here we go. Have you ever been accused of being a micromanager? That's not you. No, I, I would. I don't really that. micromanage. This isn't also you, but no, no. The next one is me. Oh, do you have great difficulty delegating? Yes, absolutely. Do you? Oh, oh yes. Okay. Even uh, when you're able projects, to do so, you feel frustrated and disappointed. Oh, group projects. Group yeah. projects in school were my nightmare. Mm-hmm. I just do all the work. Yeah. At the time when I was in school, people would just be like, yeah, that's fine. You just do all the work. Okay, I actually think you're a combo, but I'll keep going. Okay. When okay. you miss the in- insanely high mark on something, do you accuse yourself of not being cut off for the job and, r- like, ruminate on it for days? I do, like, when whenever I miss the mark on something, I will... I don't think I'll say, like, oh, I'm not cut off for this, but I will... It will I will ruminate on it for forever sure. and for the last question for the perfectionist do you feel like your work must be 100 percent perfect 100 percent of the time kind of but <laughs> i don't know it, okay it, let's jump to the one that i think also pairs pretty okay well, well for can, you. I, can we can we do a, every other one can i do number two yeah, of course for you, you and see if you are this yeah the superwoman or superman yeah do you often push yourself to work harder and harder to measure up i think so yeah i think so okay (laughs) do you stay later at the office than the rest of your team even past the point that you've completed the day as necessary work i yes years ago yes Uh now i come home and do it i remember you talking about you you were sort of evolution on i had how much you had to because i had to set some pretty 
yeah know, hard lines for myself you were kind of running yourself into your into the ground doing your job well a i was little also too hard. doing the thing that everyone tells you not to do which is i was like i was taking grading like to bed literally mm-hmm. and i had to be like you have to stop like mm-hmm. there has to be places you know what i mean i have to have some sort you of have to allow balance. yourself areas uh-huh. of your home that are not just that okay so my first couple years yes but now i i do much better with my boundaries uh-huh but i think this year i have probably you've probably seen me do more work than ever even than when i was teaching from home 100 percent of the time Mm -hmm. because i will come home and we'll hang out and grab dinner and then i'll go work for a few hours but it's a lot more comfortable for me to work here than at school Uh uh-huh but in my old place my first couple years i didn't really have a workspace in my house like my apartment so that's one of the the benefits of this is that we have a space that i can go work Mm -hmm. and that's like not where we watch movies and it's not right you know what i mean yeah so, I that's think important I probably talked about that before on the podcast but having a dedicated office space if you're lucky enough to have that in y- your home just a place where you go to only do right. work mostly yeah uh, we have an office and i need that mental gate well, it's around a separation yeah. yeah i just need it's a, a place border between this and that to yeah. concentrate really hard on I agree work with that. okay next one do you get stressed when you're not working and find downtime completely wasteful yes and no there are definitely times where i can't just rest there are other times when I come home and I'm like, I'm not turning off the TV until 10 p.m. I'm like this, though. I, I get stressed when I'm not. But OK, if I'm like, OK, now the project is watching TV. Yes. If I could tell myself that, like, OK, the task right now is to watch this. I have movie. a very hard time not doing something when I know there's something that I could be doing. Yeah, I like always... I'm very I have a hard time with that. Like if the dishes need put away, I have to go do that. Yes, like that is true. I'm very like I've and I was raised this way. Like you get everything done and then you enjoy yourself. Mm-hmm. And so I'm still that way. So I get up and yeah. run through everything. So I have free time the rest of the day. I don't want things looming over me. Personally, I feel like my work is never done. And I, I've gotten better at this over the last few years. But prior to that, I didn't have much of a social life at all. So I just would work on whatever it was like i would just be glued to my laptop coding something constantly 24 7 it was just like i'd stay up till four in the morning coding something like right. it was just you know and it wasn't even necessarily always work but having a task to do all the time Kept was very much a part of my brain space sure. so i've gotten better at that one but yeah okay have you left your hobbies and passions uh, 100 <laughs> sacrifice them to work yes really yeah yeah. Because I spend my time working, not doing the things I could be doing. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it's more about, like, in your extra time, have you kind of let the things in your non-working hours yeah. fall by the wayside? My problem is that I have the time, but I'm too tired to do them. Yes. So I think that's maybe that counts, kind I think. of, yeah. Do you feel like you haven't truly earned your title, despite numerous degrees yes. and achievements? Yes. Yeah. I think that's just, like, the self-doubt, though, also. Like, that's the hard thing. As, mm-hmm. like, someone with anxiety, also. Like, and then you partner in some of these questions. It's like, whoa. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. The third type is okay. the natural genius. Okay. Are you used to excelling without much effort? Excelling without much effort. I don't know. This question is a little bit different. Like, in school, I kind of felt that way. Not that I didn't put in effort, but there were definitely a lot of times... I don't know. This you weren't much... working as hard as those around Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. That was way more true in high school. Like, in college, I worked really hard, and everyone worked hard. But I had a unique college experience. But I, But in high school and then in grad school, both, I kind of felt like I did not need to make very much effort to, survive. to go. Yeah. 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 Do you have a track record of getting straight A's or gold stars in everything you do? I have so many gold stars. Yes, you do. Uh, were you I told straight A's? Yeah. Were you told frequently as a child that you were the smart one in your family or peer group? Told frequently. No, I mean I didn't have peers being like. Well, I, I guess I kind of had peers making fun of me for being a brain, but not like my family being like, "Oh, you're the smart one." My family didn't do that. So. Do you just like the idea of having a mentor because you can handle things on your own? Yes. I mean, yes and no. Like, I'm lucky because my dad is kind of my mentor in, like, professional spaces because he's in technology and I'm in technology. Mm -hmm. He's in leadership in various ways and I would like to be. So I kind of already have one. But, yeah, the idea of having a different kind of mentor, yeah, I probably don't really. When you're faced with a setback, does your confidence tumble because you're not performing? Because not performing well provokes a feeling of shame. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Absolutely. Do you often avoid challenges because they're uncomfortable to try something you're not great at? Or because you're uncomfortable to try something you're not great at? No. I like challenges. But I feel like you put yourself out there, though. Yeah, I like challenges. I like learning new things and... Nerding. Nerding. <laughs> yes. All right, the fourth type. Go ahead. The soloist. Yes. Do you firmly feel that you need to accomplish things on your own? Um, yes. I don't need anyone's help. Does that sound like you? Yeah. 
a little bit, but also it's just because I'd rather do it because I know I'll do it right. Yeah, that's kind of like the group work thing I was talking about earlier. <laughs> like, I would rather just do the thing instead of telling someone else to do it because I just want it done. Mm-hmm. And the way that I want it done. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you t- you have a tendency to tell me to do a chore and I won't do it right away. And then so you'll just go do it. Yeah. That is the kind of thing that you... Well, it's because I want it over with. Yeah, you, and I have time. You getting it over with is more important than just like delegating the task to someone else. Well, and it's yeah. also because I assume if you haven't done it, it's because you're busy. And I'm like, oh, I have time to do it. I can go do it. Yeah. I'll just get it over with. Yeah. I My my list is what, you know, mm-hmm. I'm checking mm-hmm. things off. And that that's the last thing on my list. And you're busy. I'm going to go do it. Okay. You well, know. here's the last one on the solo list. Do you frame requests in in terms of the requirements of the project rather than your needs as a person? Hmm. That's kind of a weird, vague I'm question. I'm not sure how to take that. Yeah. Do you frame requests in terms of the requirements? I'm going so to- when you ask someone to do something, are you like, well, this project needs to be done by mm. 8, 12 or whatever, therefore go no, do this? No, I'm rather very than much like, like- I my schedule is full and therefore can oh. you take this off my plate? Yeah, no. I'm much more like if you do this one part, I can do the rest. Like that would help me a lot. You know what I mean? Like well, I can that's, usually. That's kind of like the, that would help me a lot. Is is more? It's kind of like your needs as a person. Okay, the fifth type. What yes. is it? The expert. The expert. Mm. Do you shy away from applying to job postings unless you meet every single educational requirement? No, I do. Yes, you do. I do not. I'm like, that's a bunch of bull. I'm just going yeah, to ignore you see that. Through it, I don't see. Well, through okay. It. To be fair, it took me a really long time to be comfortable doing that. Yeah. Well, not a really long time. I guess I would say, okay, so like my very first tech job, I was having extreme imposter syndrome for it. And probably I really was underqualified a bit for that kind of work. But I knew that I could teach myself yeah. on the job. You could so do it, I yeah. applied for a tech job that I probably didn't really have as strong a skill set as I should have going into it. But I wasn't. I didn't lie about it or anything. I was like, hey, look, I've been teaching myself for a couple of years. This is what I've done. And they hired me. And I learned a ton on that tech right. job. So... I mean, and I'm sure that at the time, the requirements for that posting were probably a bit beyond what I had officially, like, you know, Done. I've never had a, I don't have a computer science degree. I don't have right. experience in big, you know, companies working on tech stuff, but blah, blah, blah. I applied anyway, and it was fine. So it, it took me, I think if you do that once and then you get the job offer, you kind of get over that sort of anxiety. You have a, yeah. You're like, well, just go for it. And that's what I was, you were, you know, we were talking about this and recently and i was just like you know you just gotta go for it you Mm -hmm. gotta just requirements be damned yeah it's just so okay so another question for the expert are Mm -hmm. you constantly seeking out trainings or certifications because you think you need to improve your skills in order to succeed yes yeah for me yeah i do a lot of again all my stuff is self-taught so like trainings and certifications i'm like i'm constantly on uh video course websites that offer various kinds of trainings in tech stuff when i'm falling asleep at night i'm sitting in bed being like just scrolling through video courses trying to find something new to learn so that's the kind of learning that my brain needs to be doing a lot but it's not because i feel like pressure about it it's because i'm genuinely curious oh i I feel like i need to go get the training so i Mm, go get it interesting i need it yeah even if you even if you've been in your role for some time can you relate to feeling like you still don't know enough oh yes oh for sure i feel like everyone should though yeah i know uh and the last question for the expert is do you shudder when someone says you're an expert i've never been called an expert i don't think i have either I think if I was called it, I would probably applaud myself. I I don't th- I would I think I would object to that being called an expert because sure. I don't I don't really believe in. I experts. would love to be an expert. I don't really believe in experts at all. So you know. Oh. Well, we're on two different different sides of this. Oh, couch, I mean, aren't we? no, I like the. Uh, it's good to strive to become. You know to. Gain you don't expertise. think someone could be like an expert of the Holocaust and like genocide studies or something? Like oh yeah, that? you probably can. I just I, it's you more just like it. the. Well, it's not that I don't believe that people can have mastery of their subject. It's more that I people think people get the status or title of expert and that therefore they... I don't know. I think it tends to have a de- detrimental effect on learning is what I think I'm trying to say. The expert designation. Mm. You, you, as a student, if you're looking up to an expert, you're like, oh, well, they're an expert. And I blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And if you're an expert and you have the title of expert, it's like... How do you get to the point where you call yourself an expert, first of all? And then Mm -hmm. second of all, does that just mean that people come to you with questions or does that mean you get some extra authority or Mm -hmm. something? Anyway, I just don't think there's a switch that can be flipped to go from not expert to expert. Mm -hmm. It just seems like a weird kind of prestige oriented concept. But yeah, I do think that you can become very learned in a subject. Like that's that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, So which one of those do you think that I am? 
I think you're a mix of the natural genius and a little bit of the perfectionist. Oh. And a little bit of the soloist. Like, I don't think... I don't think people are just one of these things. I sure. think these are the five most common types, but yeah, it's I could pick and to... choose parts of these that I feel. Yeah, for and sure. And I wouldn't consider myself the natural genius. I wouldn't consider myself to be, but there are parts of that that I'm like, oh yeah, that's fair. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. So like, I just think, I think you probably are mixing and matching these things based on whatever the experience is that's making you question yourself, mm-hmm. right? Like, I think that's also part of the framing of this is that you're in a position and what is that position that causes you to doubt yourself? Uh-huh. And it it changes, you know? Yeah. Okay, so um, I read an article by PR Newswire, and uh, there's a market research technology firm called Innovate MR, and they released a new study concluding that 65% of professionals today suffer from imposter syndrome, and of those, young women are disproportionately affected. Go figure. According to the KPMG's Advancing of the Future of Women in Business Summit report, Imposter syndrome is one of the least talked about yet most prevalent issues facing professionals today. Mm. And so some of their data, um, I just pulled some that I thought was interesting for us to talk about, but it said that 75% of female execs surveyed reported experiencing imposter syndrome. Sure. 53% of female professionals between the ages of 25 and 34 are currently experiencing it, which is where we are, Mm -hmm. which I thought was fascinating. Mm -hmm. 85% of women have not spoken to someone at work about their struggles for fear of being seen as weak. 85%? Yeah. Wow. Less than five percent of employees directly address imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome with their staff. It was totally taboo. Oh yeah, and fifty percent of imposter syndrome sufferers are working moms, but still have a higher focus on work than the personal life due to feelings of guilt. Wow. So, like we were talking about even earlier, it still seems to be disproportionately affecting women, and not. I mean, obviously, men can suffer from it. There's, mm-hmm. there's not that to say, but. Um, this data is just very, very fascinating. Like even as much as seventy five percent of female execs reported experiencing it, and like. And that's like the top, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. it's interesting to see that from from the bottom to the top that women are, you know, being affected in three quarters. Because you would think once you women, get closer to the top, you wouldn't. Yeah. You wouldn't three be quarters suffering of women way. in leadership, basically. Right. So just some data to support the rest of it. And how, I'm kind of curious um, to know what percentage of men experience uh, male executives experience imposter mm. syndrome. <laughs> Probably like three percent, one percent. Yeah. <laughs> no. Okay. So that's mean, but like no, because men can doubt that... themselves, but it's it's a much different working. Field. Well, it's also just like like I, I don't know. This gets talked about a lot. Like I see this on Twitter all the time. There are people dealing with issues of tone in the way that women in corporate settings send emails. Mm-hmm. So I've they send emails these. and they're like, "Hey, sorry to bother you!" Exclamation point. Can you please get back to instead of I need this on my desk by the end of the day? Right. There's all this couching of women language. are taught to yeah. We're, we're kind of taught to behave in a certain way that is it's supposed to make it convenient is. for the people we're working with yeah the byproduct of it is that we doubt well, ourselves everything that we ask makes it feel like they're doing us a favor when in reality they're just doing they're their doing job. their job right yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay yep. so overcoming it yes lots of research on this lots of support for this but basically truly imposter syndrome is a mind game that you've trapped yourself in mm-hmm. um and so you have to do the work on yourself to convince yourself and to believe in yourself. Um, they did recommend therapy and there's a lot of like affirmations you can do to remind yourself of your worth. But like I said, it really is so much of a game in your head just to be like, I'm worthy. I am deserving. I have, you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. it's very hard to shift your thinking, but the whole thing about the affirmations and the therapy is like, once you've shifted your thinking into it, then you're going to be in a place where you can, you know what I mean? Like start to trust and believe yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously if you're dealing with like anxiety and other factors and it's just probably going to be come part of that thinking anyways yeah it's a little so hard treating to just... it all is like key because i'm i'm gonna make a statement but i i can't support this uh medically <laughs> i'm gonna guess that people who are suffering from imposter syndrome probably also have some other form of socialized anxiety probably so it might just be you and i mean like i i can't imagine that I'm sure there are, but there are probably not as many people who are suffering from just this without some sort of socialized anxiety. Yeah, that's probably also why it's taboo to talk about this issue in the workplace is because it is essentially a form of anxiety, I think, like you're saying. So discussing that stuff in the workplace can make people 
feel vulnerable or weak or whatever it is. So it's I think that's one of the reasons it just doesn't get discussed in professional mm-hmm. context. But I do I think what you're saying is right that I found this tip there's an author named Valerie Young. She's a expert on imposter syndrome. There's that word expert, but I mean people consider to, her to be an expert mm-hmm. on imposter syndrome. She's just like fighting it. The tips she has are there are gonna be times that you feel stupid, but realize that you just because you feel that way doesn't mean that you are. And then she also suggests kind of rewriting the script that you play for yourself when imposter syndrome those feelings are triggered okay if you're starting a new project or job instead of being like i have no idea what i'm doing which is something that i do a lot Mm -hmm. and be like well i may not know all the answers now but i'm smart enough to find them out (laughs) i mean it's a big shift it is a big shift but i also i'm just naturally a very curious person so i'm always kind of wanting to learn new things so i'm not really intimidated by a new project but to me, I'm just like, well, okay, I really don't know what I'm doing right now, but I will know eventually. Sure. Like, I'm not going to give up work on trying out. just because I don't know. Yeah. And then the other thing was just like accepting that it's not possible to please everybody. We've, mm. we've had conversations like that, even in social situations mm-hmm. where there's like tension or weirdness or like, you know, especially if you have a big friend group or something and there's drama in a friend group, it's like... Yeah. You can't please everybody. No. Like, nothing that you do is going to please everybody 100% of the time. So realizing that and embracing it is part of this fight toward overcoming imposter syndrome. Right. I think the best example that I can think of is that that thing that I was talking about before about applying to that job that I didn't. I only had to do that once. I only had to apply to a job that I didn't feel like I was overly qualified for once. Mm-hmm. And now and I got the job and it was a good job and I learned a lot and I don't feel nervous about applying to jobs that I might not be qualified for on paper. I don't feel nervous about that anymore. I'm just like, yeah, I'm just going to go for it. I might not have that prerequisite, but I'll just tell him like, Hey, I can learn that if you need me to learn that, but I haven't done it, but that doesn't mean that I'm not qualified for this job. So it it really is just, I feel like that's also kind of unique to what you do. Yeah, a lot of this is... Because, like, I couldn't... There are not many positions I could do that with as an educator. Yeah, yeah. Education, like, um, the, we the have requirements... Have a lot more, yeah. yeah, you have to be credentialed to yeah. teach. Like, you have to have certain things Well, in not order even to that, but jobs. I'm saying even positions that are, like, data or, like, curriculum or, like, things like that. Y- you have to have experience in doing those things before you can get a job doing those mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. I, this is a whole other issue, but I feel like some of those positions are created with someone in mind, and so... You're probably not going to get them anyways because yeah. they've been built for someone. But also, like, it, it kind of feels like the jokes we've seen on Twitter, which is, like, they want you to have a master's degree and 10 years of experience, and they want you to be fresh out of college. For and an they entry-level job. 30 cents. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, and some of the jobs that I read on, like, education stuff, I'm like, this is that. Like, these they, these are what the, you know, like, this is who it's built for. Because it's like, yeah. how could I possibly have all of the experience as right. a teacher be this age do <laughs> it's like well, the it's job not market, possible yeah the job market is incredibly screwed up right now i yeah. mean this is almost this is almost a, a joke in tech circles about job requirements like entry-level job requirements yeah. are really mid to senior level job requirements right. in these postings it's just like hey please have experience in like basically 20 years worth of tech background tech work, yeah. and it's an entry-level job yeah. and you're going to be paid dirt so right. that, that is like you're gonna thank us for hiring you yeah you're, you're gonna say thank you and and submit your resume and uh it, yeah so in it's your like, cv there's a lot and baked into the yeah. job market right now. I mean, uh, I know technology, the job market, but you know the education job market. And I think in both of those worlds, there is this baking in of ridiculous, extraordinary requirements for little pay and little appreciation and little professional growth opportunities. Well, and so, I think what both of these fields are showing us is that it's like not even surprising that so many of us are suffering at times from mm-hmm. imposter syndrome when mm-hmm. you think about all those factors. It's like, well, duh, of course, I don't feel like I have enough to do this job. Yeah. It's because yeah. on paper, I probably don't. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, man, just go get help. That's like the whole story, right? Whatever it takes. Yeah. And you are worthy. And you've got that degree, or you've got that license, or you've got that experience. You don't have to have a degree. But I think the most important thing is, like, as long as you're willing to learn, then you can do it. Like, I don't. Yeah. Well, really but the think... people who hire you have to support that. Yes, that is the problem. That's the that's the disconnect. I agree. I just meant you yeah. have to tell yourself. Well, as long sure. As I'm willing yeah, to learn. you can tell yourself a lot, but if they're not going <laughs> to give you a chance, you don't. Yeah. You're just going to be talking. Yes, to I them definitely <laughs> wish that more employers were on board with on the job training instead mm-hmm. of requirements lists that give people imposter syndrome right yeah 
So go get help. Listen to some podcasts about it. Um, get you some daily affirmations, some meds if you need them. Or just talk to your friends about it. Since and, apparently we're all feeling this, we way. don't talk about it in the workplace <laughs> yeah, ever. Right. Uh, so yeah, just you know, talk about it. Yeah, you'll learn that more people are on the same page with you about your feelings of, of being an imposter than than you realize. So yeah, at least that's you're not true. in it alone too. Cool. All right. All right. Well, are we ready to move on? Fill in the blank. Yeah. Do you want me to read last week's question? Or I do. Like I definitely to? want you to read last week's question. You want me to? Question. All right. Yeah, so yeah. last episode's question was about camp. Camp. Exclamation point. Okay. So Salute Your Shorts was a TV series by Nickelodeon in the early 90s. The show was primarily filmed at Franklin Canyon Park and the Griffith Park Boys Camp within Griffith Park in LA. In the show, what was the name of the famous camp? They had a song with the title in it. We hold you in our hearts and when we think about you, it makes us want to fart. It's called Camp Onawana. Yeah, I really want to know what it, what it is about Camp, Camp Onawana, Onawana that Onawana. causes digestive issues. It's just a joke. You're, <laughs> it's like you're... I'm making it weird, guys. You're, it's like your uh, vacation whatever experience. Yeah. It's just... Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> this episode's question. On this day of this episode being published, May 27th in 1937, the Golden Gate Bridge connecting San Francisco and Marin County, California, opened to pedestrian traffic. The following day, it opened to vehicular traffic. On that opening day, about how many people walked across that famous bridge? How many people? A lot. It was a lot. Yeah. It was more than five. More than five. <laughs> Fewer than a million. Okay. What did you learn? Ooh. The I, hardest uh, section of this podcast. I don't, yeah, we always what wait till the end. What did you learn? Um, I learned how to make pizzas. We got a pizza oven. You sure did. As a gift to ourselves. You've perfected it. Uh, I'm not sure if I've perfected it yet, but I'm getting better but every yeah. pizza gets better so i think that's getting you're not an expert i'm not an expert no but i am learning. so don't try to be because you can't be i <laughs> expert pizza pizza makers out there you can write in and complain please but... don't chelsea will tell you you're a lie i, I will tell you that chelsea you're... will tell you it's not possible crumble, and you can still be better i will crumble your foundation for you that kind of thinking is why the rest of us have imposter <laughs> syndrome no no that's it's... literally like <laughs> if you're telling me there's no chance i could ever be at the top yeah, I'm going to keep doubting what I am forever. No, no, no. Here's the thing. You definitely can be That's a, That's at the literally top. how you create imposter syndrome. There are no experts. If you think you are, you're wrong. Okay, well, what am I? Well, no, no, no. It, again, it's not that you can't have expertise. It's with this sort of notion of experts as like special set apart people rather than just we're all on a curve. They all live in their own... We're all on a kind of curve that can go on infinitely in terms of how much we've learned about something. So it's just like where you are along the curve, you might be really far along the curve. In that case, when you've become an expert pizza maker, it means that you're really far along the curve of learning. But it doesn't mean that there's not more to do along the curve. I don't think that experts would say that there isn't more to learn. Well, so that is my that's my worry about it is that sometimes we do treat it as though when you're an expert, you don't have more to learn. Hmm. So like. People in tech, if you're at the top of the tech field, you, you get to be a little arrogant sometimes. Mm. I think it's this way in academia, too. You can be seen as the expert in the room, and then you go and give a lecture somewhere, and if some little grad student dares to ask you a question about your work, it's like, oh, well, I'm an expert. How dare you? That's huh. that's the kind of attitude that makes people I haven't had worry. that experience, though. Oh, gosh. People at my grad school were so freaking snooty, and I'm just like... Yeah, well, okay. Yeah, but I'm thinking of like the professors I had and like who would truly be experts who would never say that they are. They were yeah. never that way. No, none of my undergrad professors would ever have said I'm an expert in anything. No, but I'm saying even my master's level uh, professors yeah. who were maybe closer to, I don't know. Well, I went to a extremely, <sighs> I went to an extremely prestige oriented grad school. Like, everyone was there to make a name for themselves in academia sure. and i was like okay but i'm here to learn stuff so i mean i wasn't the only one there to learn stuff but it the whole environment was essentially around yeah becoming the best and becoming having other people acknowledge that you are the best in your field and that's just not a, an environment that is actually conducive to learning because you're just trying to be the best and you know outpace everybody with your titles and whatever then your journey to become an expert then you're not really you're not going to really be learning you're just going to be kind of seeking prestige hmm. so anyway that's that's how i feel about that but okay. yeah anyway back to pizza pizza making we got a little p propane powered pizza oven and it's so cute and i love it and i cute. like making pizzas i like 
we, we I made the dough, I made the sauce, got some toppings. It's very good. You've done it's a great really job. good. You got. I've learned that you gotta you gotta pre bake the crust a little bit. We're about to eat day three of them. Yeah, we are. We're on day three of our pizza adventure here. You pre bake the crust a bit, get it a little crispy and toasty. Then you put the toppings on, stick it back in for another about forty five seconds. I think the whole process takes like a minute and a half of, of baking your pizza. It's kind yeah, of it's pretty fast. Kind of incredible. Pretty surprising. Anyway, yeah, that's what I learned. Makes you question pizza places that make you sit there that long. Yeah. Uh, maybe their ovens just don't get that hot. Maybe. But it, it is a good question. Yeah. What did you learn? Okay, this week I'm just going to talk about the electric F-150. Ooh, the lightning. Because we're very interested in it. And it's very lightning. exciting. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, if you haven't read about it, it's a really, really cool electric vehicle that's going to be coming out. I think it's going to probably put a pretty good run against the Cybertruck of <laughs> Tesla. I think that's um, so goofy. It's a beautiful truck. The F-150 is a sharp car anyways, but it's a great looking truck. And uh, we've just been reading a lot about it. We've both been interested in electric cars for a few years. Yeah, yeah. And just kind of waiting for, you know, something that seemed reasonable. Well, we kept doing this calculus. Around. Like, we're kind of like, we need a pickup truck because we live in rural Ohio and you can't carry anything anywhere without a pickup truck, sure. basically. So we're like, oh, okay, it seems like we'd need a pickup truck. But one, they're horrible for the environment. And two, maybe we should get an electric vehicle instead because mm-hmm. we want to be more eco-conscious sure so we're like doing this map between a gas guzzling pickup truck and an electric vehicle and we're, we're like, joking, oh gosh like they'll offset each other yeah i'm like well if we get one then we can have the other but now we can have both at the same time and we don't have to get it. yeah so yeah i'm excited about this vehicle it can it run a- your house for three days if you've yeah. lost electric it can just it's very very cool uh the technology it has a trunk. is well, a front they- trunk a frunk <laughs> all electric cars do a frunk yeah do they all call them frunks yeah is it the, the industry name for it is yeah. frunk okay i've never heard that before this yeah. but that's kind of a funny word but it's just uh it's really really cool technology that they're using and not like our motor vehicle industry in the united states is <laughs> the most perfect place but i'm happy to um to see strides taken towards more electric vehicles yeah we gotta get this charging network and up and so, running better in our country yeah 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 um, we're getting there but it's just cool to read about that there there is some growth in that way. And I think, like, I, some of the stuff I was reading was, like, the F-150 is, like, the best-selling truck of the past 40 years. Like, literally wow. every single year, it is the best-selling truck. I believe it, so, based on the number of them we see around here. But I feel like that's so refreshing to me that Ford was able to be like, okay, this is already it, so why not make this the one? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I just think that's really cool, because they could have made a much smaller one, like the Ranger or something like that, so... I th- it seems like a good move on their part, obviously. Yeah, it can tell more than its diesel equivalent. Yeah, I was looking at because on their website you can you can map how how long it would take you to get somewhere using the charging network that already exists, mm-hmm. and that's like the combination of like the um, the quicker charging and the regular charging because mm-hmm. there's like two different types around the United States, and like we were looking, we drove to Montana last summer, and it took us like probably about thirty hours roughly combined both days, all of that except for when we stayed at the hotel, obviously. And I mapped it on the F-150 and it was like total drive time was like 27 hours. Mm -hmm. So like it's really not that it's going to take us a little bit longer, but it's not going to be that much different. Like you and I probably wouldn't notice another hour or two in the truck at that point. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. and so that was really refreshing to me as well to to look at it in terms of something we've done to be like, oh, well, that's like only an hour further or longer in the car, two hours longer than what we really did. Yep. So it seems like it's going to be a great option and it doesn't. It doesn't seem like they're just throwing something at the market just for the sake of it being electric. Like, everything it can do seems reasonable Mm -hmm. so far. Now, Mm -hmm. this is also coming from from a place that I've never seen one in person. I've never driven one. So, but it's exciting. I'm excited for the future of that. And I think it's important. Yeah. So, especially after the pipeline crisis. So, yes. We saw in real time, we had some friends in the South who. We're running on empty. Yeah, they couldn't fill up their gas tanks. So because uh, of the pipeline, these electric cars hacked. are looking better and better. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. anyways, there are tax breaks and things like that involved. So obviously, if you're in a place that you are looking for a new car, it might be worth looking at. Yeah, look at an electric or a hybrid vehicle. So the future is electric. I hope. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, any final thoughts? Wanna happy wrap it up? summer teachers. Yeah, we happy freaking made summer it. or almost summer. You're you're almost to the finish line. Just hold on a little bit longer and uh enjoy enjoy your time off teachers. As I'll well. see you in 2 weeks. Yeah, we'll talk to you all in 2 weeks. Bye. See ya.
listeners. Thanks for supporting 16 to 1. We're trying to grow our audience, so please check us out at 16to1.com, all spelled out, and tell your friends about the show. On our website, you can find links to follow us on social media, an archive of all our old episodes, and a contact form where you can get in touch. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next show. There's an imposter among us.